In this video, we're going to examine how the frequency response of a discrete time system is related to the poles and zeros of its transfer functions. We'd like to be able to go from something like h of z, which is the transfer function, and understand how the frequency response, and specifically the amplitude response and phase response of the system behave. So let's start off right here with a very generic description of a transfer function of a discrete time linear system. On the numerator, we have all the zeros of the system, and I've gone ahead and factored that out. Typically, you have polynomials in z on the numerator, polynomials in z on the denominator. If you factor those into the, you know, just factor the polynomial, you can always write that polynomial as a product of its roots. So on the numerator, we have a zero at z1, a zero at z2, possibly a total of n zeros. Similarly, on the denominator, we factored that into z minus gamma one, z minus gamma two, et cetera. So these, gamma one and gamma two, represent pole locations of the system. And again, there are possibly up to n poles in the system. And after you've done that factoring, in general, there's going to be some uh, numbers out front, which we can lump into a number k. So this is a very generic way of writing an arbitrary transfer function, h of z. What we want to do is now map these zero and pole locations and relate them to the frequency response. So if we evaluate the transfer function on the unit circle, so if we replace z with e to the j omega, what we get is the frequency response of the system. So that's what I've done down here. I've replaced every single z quantity with e to the j omega, and now this complex quantity here is a function of omega, and it is the frequency response of the system. So notice what I have here. I have a whole bunch of e to the j omega minus z1, e to the j omega minus z2, e to the j omega minus gamma 1, etc. Let's think through what those quantities are. Well, first of all, just remember, e to the j omega, for any omega you give me, is just some number on the unit circle, right? e to the j omega is cosine of omega plus j sine of omega. It's a real component, has an imaginary component somewhere on the unit circle. So when I talk about e to the j omega minus zi, that's really just this vector that points from the zero location to the point on the unit circle, e to the j omega. Similarly, this subtraction, e to the j omega minus gamma i, is a vector that starts at the pole location and lands at that point on the unit circle. So if you kind of picture what's going on in the numerator and the denominator, really we just have all these vectors multiplied by each other. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go from really this quantity, which is in rectangular coordinates, to polar coordinates. So let's do that right here. My original quantity is a complex number minus a complex number. It gives you a complex number, but any complex number can be written in terms of its magnitude and phase. So on the numerator, I'm going to denote that magnitude of each component by r. Kind of think of that as like a radius or a distance and some angle phi. So every e to the j theta minus zi, we can write as some distance e to the j phi. Similarly, on the denominator for all the poles, e to the j omega minus gamma i is just some complex number. A complex number has a magnitude and phase. There we'll represent the magnitude by d, so think of it as a distance at some angle theta. So after we do all that, we can now write the res frequency response like this, right? Here's all these equivalent forms in the numerator, just polar notation, same thing on the denominator. Now the nice thing about this form is I can now factor things a little bit differently. All of the r's I can bring out front into this product. All of the d's on the denominator I can bring into this product. And then I can take all the exponential terms, v1, v2, add all those up due to the property of exponentials. And then we have an exponential in the denominator so that's minus the sum of those terms. So all of the phase terms can get lumped into this single exponential term. The reason I like this form right now is because taking the amplitude and phase of it is now a lot easier. Think what would happen if I took the magnitude of this quantity. e to the j anything is magnitude 1, and I can compute the amplitude response pretty easily. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's take the magnitude of that quantity. The e to the j components go away, and all I'm left with is this right here. Remember, r's and d's are already distances, they're already positive. So in terms of words, here's a nice way of thinking about the amplitude response. It's really, on the numerator, just a product of distances from all the zero locations to wherever I'm at on the unit circle. 
And on the denominator, I have a product of distances from all the poles to where I'm at on the unit circle. So thinking about the amplitude response in this way is really just a ratio of distance. Here I am on the unit circle at this point omega. Figure out what all the distances are to all the zeros, multiply those together, and then on the denominator, find the distance between that point on the unit circle and all the poles, multiply all those together. It's just a ratio of those numbers. So you can kind of you know, graphically imagine as you're moving around the unit circle how these distances are changing and how the amplitude response will go up and down. We can do a similar thing on the phase response. If we go back to kind of that nice polar form of our frequency response and take the angle, well, we had all those numbers out front, right? The R's and the K and the D, those are all positive numbers, so they don't have an angle. All I'm left with is the E term, and it's the sum of the phi's minus the sum of the thetas. That's all I'm left with for the phase response. In terms of words, look what we have. This right here is a sum of angles to the zeros. This is a sum of angles to the poles. So in terms of words, the phase response also has a nice representation. It's just take the point that you're at on the unit circle, find the angle to all the zeros, add those up, do the same thing for the poles, take where you're at on the unit circle, draw lines to all the pole locations, find those angles, add them up, and then compute the difference. So again, you can kind of picture as you're moving around the unit circle, keeping track of these angles and doing the appropriate additions and subtractions. All right, so that's kind of the theory and a way of thinking about both the amplitude response of the system and the phase response of the system in terms of its zero locations and pole locations. In the next video, we're actually going to go to MATLAB on the computer, and we're going to work through some very specific examples. Here's one of the first ones we're going to do. In this system right here, we only have two pole locations. So guess what happens? As I walk around the unit circle, say to this point right here, that point on the unit circle is very close to this pole, which means its distance is very small. So it turns out that this point on the unit circle corresponds to this frequency right here where my amplitude response is peaking. Why is it peaking? Because my denominator term has a distance to that pole that gets very small. So we're going to practice that in MATLAB. We're going to draw different pole zero plots and show what the corresponding amplitude response is to get a feel for how you can kind of graphically walk around the unit circle and map out a sketch of the filters, frequency response, amplitude response, and phase response. So check that out in the next video.